Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now, here's a message from Pastor Jim Cobray. Father, we just come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. How good it is to be man, in the house of the Lord. You know, Lord, I know it thrills you to see your people in church. We work really hard around here to get people to come to church. Tonight, Lord, I would ask that you bless these saints of God because they're here. They could have said, well, I want to stay home. I've worked hard. I'm hungry. I'm tired. Freeway was crazy today. My boss is ugly on me today, and I just want to stay home and kind of rest and justify it not being here. But they came, Lord. These people said no to the flesh, no to their thinking, no to their hunger, and said, I'm going to church tonight. And God, I pray that the word of the Lord would be life-changing to them tonight because they are very special, that we draw closer and closer to you, but we also draw closer and closer to each other. And we love, respect, and honor each other. We thank you, Father, for your word as the Holy Spirit causes it to become alive We thank you for all the churches in the Inland Empire that are preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We bless them as well as blessing us. In Jesus' mighty name, the great big shout we all say, amen. Amen. Go ahead, take your seat. And get your Bible and find a couple of uh, passages. I'm going to take you to 2 Chronicles tonight. I'm going to take you to, to, um, if you will, to Jonah. Tonight, and I want to share some things with you as we go to the word of the Lord. It's kind of fun as you open the Bible and just kind of talk a little bit. But let's let's get something out of this. Let me explain the title to you. The title is simply this, Praising Through Pain. For for me, Dr. Kanga, when he talked to me last week, remember I gave you the insight about what Dr. Kanga said to me. Richard said this. He said, uh, it's time maybe to stop so much praying, get into some praising. At that time, at that very moment, there was a change inside of me. There was something on the inside. Deborah describes it like this. She said, said, did it feel any better? Do you feel? And it was no change that I could sense. I just knew everything had changed. I don't know, but faith is kind of like that. Faith, over the years, I've discovered this, that Faith, sometimes nothing changes, but everything has changed. It's the most interesting thing in the world. Somehow, the pain was still there in my back and the gnawing and the uh, horrible, intense drama that was coming from the, my back area that the surgery had. It's a fallen, failed surgery, so uh, it is, it's, it's, it's not good. But somehow, at that very moment, when I got out of just myself and I started to praise God everything changed mentally spiritually in my heart and physically everything changed started to change and it's been getting better and better every single week since that in the last couple of three weeks that that since that took place so it was really fascinating and last week I was talking about praising God but I wanted to go into the biblical stance the very principle you know everything is established in the word of God by principles. Did you know that? I mean, out of the mouth, listen to this, of two or three witnesses. So in other words, you don't come to church and hear some guy give you his opinion about the word of God. Unless it's described in scripture two or three times minimum, it is not a principle that should be adhered to or we should apply in our life. And so I wanted to show you the biblical references to literally praising God in your and through your pain. Could I say something to you? I don't care who you are, there'll be pain in your life from time to time. Pain, if you have a family, there'll be pain through the family, pain through the kids, pain through relatives. Anybody ever had that? Pain through, you know, defilement, pain through, if you will, Uh, People being dishonest, pain and loss of economics, pain on the job, pain physically, mentally, stressfully, spiritually, there's pain. And how well you deal with the pain 
is going to determine how far you're going with God. Now, someone said to me one time, why does God allow pain to even be there? Why did he just remove the pain? I really think it's the arm of God that challenges us. And in the midst of pain, we get closer to God and we learn life lessons. I find that when things are tough, we grow. When things are not tough, we just kind of cruise and, if you will, graze. We're like sheep that'll graze in the field and not be bothered, never accomplish anything, and just kind of cruise. So the training ground that we have for our own lifestyles oftentimes is caught up in this word pain. That's why God doesn't remove it, because it's in the pain that I grow to be the, become the mature Christian. It's in the pain that I find my way to God and back to God and deep in relationship with God, that I need God. And I find that life has changed. Through this whole thing with Deborah and I and, this, and the pain of this surgery, I tell you, I never thought this. I mean, I've been a theologian for 37 years. I never thought in a million years that there was a whole lot for me to learn. I saw myself learning so much through this pain and having, listen to this, passed the test. Because oftentimes it's a test, my friend, to see what you're going to do and how you're going to deal with it. You know, a lot of times people have pain. They start to blame God. They start to criticize God. Well, why does God allow this? Why does God want this to happen? Why does God expect me and how does he expect me to deal with this? What's this all about? I mean, if he really loves me, why would he let me go through this? Well, wait a minute, I heard my pastor say that God can do anything. And if he can do anything, then why in the world has he not brought me out of this? Why did he let me go through this miserable time? Here's my question to all of us. Could it be a training time? Because you're going to see that tonight. In the midst of great people, there was great praise that brought them out of their problems. I, I bet you, if you went to David, you'll find that he praised God while Saul, the king of Israel, was chasing him. If you went to Joseph while he was in Potiphar's prison in the prison of the Pharaoh, I bet you he stayed pure before God with praise and worship to God. Remember when Potiphar's wife came in? What did he say? Here is an open door for him to get out of prison and get back to the things she wanted him sexually. And he said, listen, I will not sin against my God. Don't you think that's a praise? Yeah. I will not sin against my God. Every great person in the midst of their praise has two choices. Back off of God or get closer to God. And it's in those two choices that your blessings, your promised land, and the life that God has for you is waiting for you. So times may not be so great for you. Times are tough. You have a lot of pain in your heart or in your mind or your soul or like me in your body. But I'm telling you, if you can get into a routine of praising God through the pain, you'll come out on the other side. Now, we're going to see examples in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament, which is really kind of bizarre in the Bible. We'll see these examples, and they get instantaneously delivered, where I, be honest with you, I haven't physically gotten the deliverance yet, but there will be a day. Amen. You cannot talk me out of that. It's just something I know that 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 God's, I just know it. You can't talk me out of it. You say, well, pastor, you're still hurting. That's why you're sitting in that chair. Yep, guess what? And I'm going to keep praising God in this long, listen to this. And in my praise, a couple of things happen. One, I'm encouraged in my heart and faith. In my praise, I also found something else happening. I can be, because I'm encouraged, my heart's not down, I start to hear from God better. So I haven't walked, and I haven't been able to stand on my feet for any more than maybe 10 minutes in the last three months. 10 minutes, boom, man, I'm, and I'm always looking for a seat. And I became so sensitive to God, you know, every time I start to pain up and pain is excruciating through my back, I would look for a seat to sit down because there I get like 20 or 30% relief. Not 100%, but 20 or 30%. And that was better than standing up. Then God speaks to me in the food lines the other day, last Tuesday morning. And I'm in the food lines and I'm 
you know, greeting people and telling them I love them as they're coming in. And we are so happy that they came. They're looking at me like I'm crazy. And all of a sudden, God says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to stand every day for an hour. Today, I stood for two hours without sitting down. See, and, and at the end of the two hours, now, wait a minute. So you can say anything you want to say. God spoke that for me, and I would never have heard him if I hadn't been praising God, had a clear heart and clear mind. And the praise kept me clear enough to hear from God. Kept my faith strong. Are you following me? So today I want to share with you, of course, the first one we're going to look at is Jehoshaphat. Now, it's, Jehoshaphat's an interesting character in the Bible. Jehoshaphat, everybody knows, many of you already know this story. Go with me to 2 Chronicles 20th chapter. 2 Chronicles 20th chapter. Let me take a look with you. And uh, let's take a look, if you will, at verse number three. And I love this verse. This verse is so cool. Everywhere, you, you know, you can follow Jehoshaphat. For those of you that think, well, who's Jehoshaphat? He's a king of Judah. He's one of the good kings of the two southern tribes of Judah. There were, there were 12 tribes, and there's two southern tribes. And here's Benjamin, and here's uh, uh, Judah. And he's the king, and his name is Jehoshaphat. What a funny name. But when you find Jehoshaphat in the Bible, he's always after God. He's doing two things you'll find over and over about Jehoshaphat. Someone's asking him for help, and then he says, yes, I can hardly wait to help you. What a cool guy. The second thing you find out about Jehoshaphat that's really cool is after he says, yeah, I'll help you, then he says, is there a man of God in this city to tell us what to do? He looks for, because remember the prophet in those days is like the Bible. Instead of you having it written in your lap, they didn't have it written in their lap, so the prophet came and spoke to them. Is that, are you following me? So the prophet was like the one who traveled the word of God and they got their direction from the prophet of God. Jehoshaphat is always looking to hear from God. Totally cool. Now in verse number three of the 20th chapter, I wanna read it to you because I want you to follow this. Remember, what we're gonna show you tonight is really cool because in your pain, either it's tonight or tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, whatever it is, you're going to have it in your life. You've got to remember these principles that God clearly outlines for you to do in order not to stay in your pain, but to get out of it and go past that. Is that okay? So in the third verse, listen to what it says about Jehoshaphat. It says, and Jehoshaphat feared, isn't it wonderful that word fear? Well, without fear, you never do anything. Without fear, you complain. Without fear, you, you know, you're always bitter. Without the fear of God, you never want to do anything. You just, you're just always there. Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord. Notice how he set, you ought to circle that in your Bible. He set himself to seek the Lord. How many of us say to God, God, if you want me to be that way, then make me that way. Or God, help me to be that way or help me to do this. But I'm here to tell you something. Notice the attitude of this guy. He is seeking after God and he sets himself to do something, seek after the Lord. And proclaim a fast throughout all of Judah. So Judah gathered together, verse number four, and asked help from the Lord. And from all of the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. Is that cool? Now let me set up the whole scenario for you. You can understand how cool it is. What kind of pain were they in? There were massive amounts of enemies coming at them. Thousands and tens of thousands and probably hundreds of thousands of trained soldiers from numerous nations have gathered together even across the seas. And they were coming in and he hears about these people coming to make war against Judah. And he doesn't know what to do. He's got a bunch of farmers. He's got a small amount of soldiers, but very small, not hundreds of thousands of professional soldiers like the ones that are coming after us. You know something, you talk about pain. Pressure oftentimes bring an ama amazing amount of pain. And he's in this pain right now of wondering, oh my God, we're going to be annihilated. Can you imagine what it was like to go into those kinds of hand-to-hand -hand combat? Can you imagine what it was like? You're fighting, maybe you're doing something, and all of a sudden a sword or a spear sticks through your back. 
All of a sudden, someone throws a hatchet and you lost a hand or an arm. Oh my goodness, sakes alive. You can be at the wrong place at the wrong time and lose a leg while you're trying to win a battle. You were nothing but a few days ago farming your field. And now we see hundreds of thousands of trained soldiers that are the enemies of Israel coming against Judah. And the first thing he does is he seeks God. When you and I are under pressure, the first thing we've got to do is never lose sight of what this is really all about. Sometimes our pain is so real, we forget about God because God is spiritual. And we need to realize that we need to set ourselves in the midst of pain to seek after God. He had the pressures, my friends. He had the pain, my friends. You will have the pressures. You will have the pain. You might even have them tonight. But while you're sitting there, if you will seek God for the answers, set yourself aside. In this particular case, he called for all of Judah to fast. They're going to do something to get the attention of God and also to keep themselves strong. I had to do something to get the attention of God. I already had the attention of my doctors. I already had the attention of the church. I already had people from all over the world praying. But that wasn't what I wanted. What I needed was God. They can't heal me. God can heal me. And so we find ourselves oftentimes doing something different than what we should be doing, setting ourselves, like he said, to seek the Lord. In the midst of your pain, the direction you go is to God. It's got to be that way. Verse 15, let me jump you ahead a little bit. And he said, listen to all of Judah, you inhabitants of Jerusalem, and you King Jehoshaphat, thus saith the Lord to you, do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great, great, how many realize when God says great multitude, there's a great multitude for the battle? He says a great multitude for the battle is not yours but God's. In the midst of your pain, you gotta realize it's not your pain and the battle's not yours but God's. I can't get out of it. I can't make it go away. I can't do anything about it, but here's what I know. The battle, I can only do what I can do. You can only pray what you can pray, but here's the truth. The truth is, the battle is really God's. Would you sit back and let God be God? But unless you're connected with him, you won't sit back and let God be God. You will try every other angle instead of the things of God. We need to be a people that are wise enough to just be like this. Hey, the battle's, somebody, that's for you tonight. The battle's not yours, it's God's. And as soon as you let it go to God, start praising him, as they're gonna see in a minute, guess what happens? He'll start changing your future. We don't do enough of that. I mean, the Bible talks about it all the time. Let me go ahead and take you down to verse number 17. You will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourself, How? to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, who is with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not fear it or be dismayed. Tomorrow, go out against them, for the Lord is with you. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem bowed before the Lord, worshiping, worshiping, not running, not complaining, not frightened, not saying, where are you, God? What's going on? How come you didn't do this to me? What, you could have healed me when you didn't. How come you could have supplied my needs? You could have not let that happen. I'm kind of angry at you, God. Guess what? Get over it and start praising God. They started to worship the Lord. Verse number 20. And so they arose early in the morning and then went out in the wilderness of Tekeah. And as they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem, believe in the Lord your God, and listen to these words, and you shall be established. Same thing goes today. Believe in the Lord your God, and you shall be established. Believe in the Lord. Stop getting off of who you are. Stop looking at your bank account. Stop looking at your boss. Stop looking at for somebody else to come in. The battle is God's. Stop looking for aunt to give you some money. Stop looking for a loan to come through. Stop looking for your credit card. Start looking to God. God is the one who's going to relieve the pressure that brings the pain. Somebody ought to give me a great big amen. 
He says, and you shall be established. Believe in his prophets. Oh my goodness. And you shall, what's that word? You have to be out of your mind to think that God doesn't want to prosper you. Wait a minute, I'm hurting, I'm down, I'm out, I'm discouraged, I'm frustrated. I live in a world of mental pain. I live in a world of economic pain. I live in a world of family pain. I live in a world my kids are driving me crazy. My wife or my husband are driving me nuts. I live in a world of pain and you're telling me what? God wants to prosper. He's not talking about money in your pocket. He's talking about the life you're looking for and God's the one that does it. And that same promise to those people is the same promise to you and I today. Come on, somebody. You know it's true. Verse number 21, and when he had consulted the people, he appointed those who sang in the Lord and those who praised the beauty of his holiness and they went out before the, before the, before the, before the army. My goodness, you gotta be kidding me. He's sending all the tambourines and singers and dancers out there. The army's back there and out in the head is all of the singers and praisers. And they're shouting these words, praise the Lord for his mercy endureth forever. And when they began to sing and to praise, now get this, verse number 22. And when they began to sing and, and when they began to sing, some of you need to begin. When they began to sing and praise, I tell you what, man, it was hard. I was hurting so bad, all I wanted to do was fall down and get in the fetal position and cry. And I was sweat through my clothes from the pain. And then I stood up and I started to praise God. And when I began to praise the Lord, things at that moment started turning around. I've turned around ever since then. I didn't say I didn't have problems and pains. But oh, I got a clear mind, a good heart, and I'm going to get through this completely. Is anybody listening? And when they began to sing, some of you need to begin something like this and praise. The Lord said ambushes against the people. He didn't set ambushes against the people until they started to praise. Your enemy that's trying to stop you economically, your enemy that's putting pressure on you maritally, your enemy that's trying to destroy your future, your life, your job, your, your relationship, your enemy, well, let me tell you something, it wasn't until they started to praise that God started to do something. Notice what it says. He said ambushes against the people of Ammon and, 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 and uh, Moab and, and Mount Sur, and who had come to Judah, and they were defeated. How'd they get defeated? God fought the battle. How'd they fight the battle? When they started to praise. Now, I don't know something uh, that I want to share with you. It's really kind of bizarre. It's found in the book of Jonah. And uh, you'll find Job right there by Obadiah and all the small prophets who got it. These are the small prophets. And I, I, I think you'll find this fascinating. I want you to go find Jonah with me. And I want to read something about Jonah from the book of Jonah. Everybody knows the story of Jonah. Jonah's asked by God to do something. And, and God asked him to go to a place called Nineveh. That'd be like somebody from Beverly Hills going to San Bernardino. Or how about Santa Barbara from December, do you know? And, and he says to God, he says, I'm not going. I mean, bottom line, God says, Jonah, you know, you love me, you fast, you do all those good things, you go to church all the time, you tithe. You know who I am, I know who you are. I need you to do something. I really care about these people over in Nineveh. And I, I, I really care about them because I, here's what God knew about the people at Nineveh. He knew what Jonah didn't know. What Jonah saw was the outside of these people. They were rascals and unworthy of anybody going to them. But God saw the depths of their heart and they were ready to accept the Lord, make some changes. And he needed somebody to go. And, and Jonah says, you know the story, I'm not going. And he jumps on a boat, you know, and the boat, sinks and they throw him overboard in a boat and he's in the water and a fish comes and puts him in the belly. And he's in the belly of this fish. Let's take a look at it. And I want you to see some things take place that brought his, him out of the painful situation that he's in. Some of you tonight, you're in a painful situation. I don't know what it is. Maybe your heart's gotten hard. Maybe you fell out of love. 
Maybe you're discouraged about life. Pain is really on you all the time. You've actually questioned, God, where are you? Why don't you help me? And I want you to see the position this man is in and what it takes for him to get out of that bad position. Because some of you are in a bad position. Is that okay? I'm going to take you, if I may, to verse 17, the first chapter. Remember, he's asked him to go to Nineveh. He says, not going to go. Verse 17 says, now the Lord has prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. Oh, my God. I mean, you can do about anything but a great fish to swallow Jonah. A lot of people don't believe this story. But did you know a scientific, a mariner's scientific discoveries have discovered Mediterranean fish, not whales, Mediterranean fish that are so big that 40 people could live in their belly for a long period of time, like two or three days. 40 people. You can read that in your encyclopedia if you wanted to. So the people that say, I don't believe that. Well, go read scientifically how many people could live in a belly of a Mediterranean fish. And as far as I'm concerned, he's in the Mediterranean area. You know it and I know it. It's one of the oldest books. And God, I love this, God knows what he's doing with every one of us. So God does something. And he doesn't do something for Jonah to get Jonah's attention. He does something for you and me. Because the story of Jonah is really all about you and I. Instead of serving God, we don't serve God. And so we need to start serving God his way and not our way. Jonah wanted to do it his way instead of God's way. Jonah said, look, I'll serve you over there where it's a good place. No, I need you to go to Nineveh. No, I'm not going to Nineveh. So God does something. He prepares a big fish to swallow him. Now, wait a minute. The guy's on dry land when God is preparing the fish. Is that wild? And then he comes along and he says this word. He says, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now, I don't know about you, but have you ever thought about what it would be like to be in the belly of a fish? I mean, I, I, I go fishing. Sometimes Debbie and I, you know, we get on our little boat and we will fish, you know, and I, they stink. You know, and there's something about saltwater fish. They stink more than freshwater fish. And if you ever gut them and take out the insides, that stinks even more. In fact, you know what I'm talking about because like a day later, you're going like this to your hands. I washed them really good. Uh, they still smell like fish. You go eat your Wheaties in the morning because you just gutted the fish that night. And you go, these Wheaties smell like fish. <laughs> Anybody know what I'm talking about? Am I all alone in this place tonight? And you know, it's the wildest thing in the world because living inside of a belly of a fish for three days and three nights, according to the Bible. Here he is, three days, three nights. What's in that fish? Yeah, let me tell you, it ain't no couch. <laughs> There's not Verizon television uh, on demand. No popcorn machines. I imagine, wouldn't you, that it's absolutely pitch black. I imagine that it's full of stomach acids that would dissolve anything. I imagine you would feel like your clothes is rotten off of you. Your hair has been removed and looks like Fred Adams. <laughs> and you're absolutely lost at all. Every time you open your eyes, if you try to, it's all you see is a nothing. And you gotta be burning like crazy. Three days you haven't drank any water. Three days you haven't eaten anything. You're in the belly of this whale and there's no a big fish and there's no way out. You talk about having problems and pain and pressure. I mean, nobody in this room will ever be in that kind of a situation. That's why God put it in there. That's why it's a real story. Because if we can see what this guy did to get delivered out of the belly of that fish, then you and I can get delivered out of anything that we're in right now. Is that not true? That's why it's here, my friends. Listen closely. So he's in this belly of this fish. I can't imagine what it's like for three days. By now, I would have been cursing God. I would have said, ah, you God, I don't understand you. That's what most of you would have done by now. You'd have lost your mind. 
in three days. One minute would be different. Three days, three nights? You gotta be kidding me. I'm, I'm losing it here. Verse one of second chapter. Verse one, and Jonah prayed to the Lord. His God from the fish's belly. When you're in the midst of pain, you can go to the doctor all you want, and I thank God for doctors. We have so many of them in our church. Without doctors, most of us Christians would have died because we don't know how to use our faith at all. And I thank God for doctors, but you can go to your friends and your relatives and you can get a solution to your pain for momentarily, but until you get to the place where you call upon the name of God, your God, in the midst of your pain. It goes on and it says, and he cried out and he talked to God. And he but I'm going to pull you forward a little bit and take you to verse number nine. Then Jonah says this, but I will sacrifice to you with the voice of, I will sacrifice to you with a voice of, wait a minute. In other words, I will sacrifice and say thank you, God. You gotta be kidding me. I've got fish eggs all around me. I've got seaweed around my head and my neck. You gotta be kidding me. And, I, and it, when you start praising God in the midst of your pain, it is a sacrifice of praise. And that's what God's talking about all through it. You hear those words through scripture, it's a sacrifice of praise. Praise oftentimes is easy when things are going good, but praising God when you're in your pain is that sacrifice of praise. And the word says he sacrificed to you with, with what? With a voice of thanksgiving. He's praising God, telling God, thank you, God. I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. Finally, after the very verse, did you ever notice the most important verse in the book of Jonah and the most interesting of all of it is the next verse. Because the next verse says something that's really bizarre. Verse number 10. So the Lord spoke to the fish. <laughs> you gotta be kidding me. You're going to tell me your God can't do what he wants to do? Can't handle your little problem and your little pain and your little economic condition and your little marital spats? You're going to tell me that God who speaks to fish? I could speak to a fish. I got 11 goldfish in my backyard. I speak to them. They do not listen. They only come to the surface when I put food. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? And they could care less about me. So I don't feed them until like a week. And then they come up around me. Uh -huh. I can speak to them all I want. They don't listen. The Bible says in verse number 10, interesting, God spoke to the fish. And it vomited Jonah on dry land. The most interesting words you've ever seen right there is the fish finally after Jonah sacrifices Thanksgiving. Next verse comes, listen to this. God taking care of the problem, speaking to the fish, and the fish vomits Jonah up. No, two of the most interesting words in the Bible. Want to know what they are? Found in verse number 10. Look at it again. Dry land. He didn't vomit him in the middle of the ocean where he can drown. This is a big fish. Didn't vomit him in the bay. Didn't vomit him out there and throw him a rope or a, uh, uh, you know, a life preserver. He, he tells the fish, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to shore where there's dry land, get up there, vomit him out, and go back to sea. You don't tell me God doesn't have the most amazing ability to do whatever he wants to do. He 
ocean, vomit him out in the middle of the ocean or in the channel or out there, you know, out there by past Catalina and he's got to swim 30 miles? Set a new world record for the Mediterranean Sea here. God's got it all under control in a perfect situation, dry land. Tells the fish, you don't let him out here. Let him out over there. Come on, guys. In verse after the sacrifice of thanksgiving, is it, you think that's a coincidence. That's not a coincidence. That's two examples from the Old Testament. Let's take a look at the New Testament. Here's Paul and Silas. They're in the town of Philippi. There they meet some great people, Lydia. She starts a church in her home. They're out preaching. This demon-possessed woman, if you will, in Acts the 16th chapter, comes up to them. It's the craziest story you ever saw in your life in Acts the 16th story. This woman is demon-possessed. You would not know she's demon-possessed because she says all the right things. If you're not in tune with God, you'll hear the right things. We got the wrong people. And how many of you hear the right things from the wrong people? That's why you had lousy marriages. I know I've had a bunch of them, <laughs> more than all of you together. Because we heard the right thing from the wrong people. The right thing's coming out of this little demon-possessed woman. She's yelling at the crowd, listen to these guys, listen to these guys, they're men of God. Paul all of a sudden says, I'm tired of this woman. She's got a demon, goes down, casts the demon out of her. The problem with it is, is in her lifestyle, her witchcraft, she was creating a culture in the city that a lot of people made a lot of money over. So they would sell these trinkets to ward off all of the evil spirits. And they were making a fortune selling jewelry and stuff to people who were visitors in this area of Philippi. And when they came, they'd buy all this stuff. And all of a sudden, now the woman is clean from all the demons and she's not creating a problem. So therefore, guess what? All the people lose money. So they start complaining to the magistrate, the people that are in leadership, you know, you ought to throw those guys in jail. They're causing a lot of problems. So they take Paul and Silas they beat him and throw him in jail. Can I just share this with you? May I, may I say this? I haven't done anything wrong except preach Jesus. So I want to take you, if I may, and let's go and take a look at this together. In the 16th chapter, verse 22. Then the multitude rode up against them, and the magistrate tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. Verse 23. And when they had laid many stripes on them, can I just say something? When God says many stripes, they were, the snot was knocked out of them. You talk about being in pain. First of all, just being arrested for doing nothing but good, casting a devil out of a woman ought to tick somebody off. Being arrested for telling the truth, that's like crazy. Wait a minute, I'm telling the truth here about Jesus Christ. That's crazy. Now I cast the devil that's obviously the woman's free and now you beat me and many stripes are on me and you throw me in prison? And when they had laid many stripes on them, verse number 23, they threw them in prison commanding the jailer to keep them securely. So he tells the jailer, jailer, you better not let these guys go. Having received such a charge, the jailer says, he, says, he put them in the inner prison and fastened their feet into stocks. So here they are with their feet in stocks and the inner prison, not even the outer prison, the inner prison. There is no way they're getting out. They have got pain, they have got problems, they have got trials, they've got tribulations. They're facing the whole thing. There's no way anybody can ever figure out how to get them out of there. Nobody gonna bust them out. There's nobody gonna violently get them out. They've been beaten, their back's bloody, they're in stocks, they're in a prison. And guys, the worst part of it, they haven't done a thing. Wrong. They haven't done a thing wrong. And all of a sudden, you see them in a position of great pain, which a lot of you have been in. But watch this. Verse number 25. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. Oh. Let me try that again. At midnight, Paul, Silas, and Pastor Jim were cussing God out. Did your Bible say that? 
me try to read it again with more logic. At midnight, Pastor Deborah was huffing and puffing and complaining about her husband. <laughs> At midnight, in the midst of their pain, they're singing hymns to God and the prisoners are listening to them. And then, you know what happens? The next verse, listen to this, verse number 26. Suddenly, I haven't got my suddenly yet. Mm, my suddenly's coming. Come on, somebody. Some of you, I like suddenly more than take your time, God. But suddenly, did you know God's a God of suddenly? Suddenly. <laughs> oh, there's going to be a day when I get up out of bed and suddenly. And grandpa's going to start chasing grandma immediately. Yeah, 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 yeah. And grandma better get ready. All right, let's get serious here. Suddenly, uh, next verse, very next word. You need a suddenly in your life. You say, how many need a suddenly in your life? Ah, oh, you need to start praising God. And don't stop until your suddenly shows up. And it goes, <laughs> suddenly, there was a great earthquake. Can I just say something? This is Jerusalem. I thought Southern California only had earthquakes. <laughs> this is a great earthquake. Now watch this earthquake. <laughs> so that the foundation of the prison was shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everybody's chains fell loose. Can I ask you a question? What in the heck is that? What kind of an earthquake shakes off your chains? Huh? Is anybody listening? I'm asking you a question. What kind of an earthquake shakes off your chains? Somebody could say, well, there's a big earthquake, open up the doors. But what kind of earthquake shakes the chains? I mean, you've been pulling on them all along. What kind of an earthquake shakes the chains? See, some of you got chains and you don't know how you're going to get out of it. And you need a sudden earthquake in your life. And God knows how to deliver the fish to spit you on dry land. Is that not true? God knows how to tell the fish, spit them on dry land. Spit them right over there. All of a sudden, suddenly comes an earthquake. How am I going? I can understand the doors being broken open, but I can't understand the chains being broken. Mm. Immediately, the prison was shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and everybody's chains were loosed. What's he trying to tell us tonight? In the midst of prayers, there comes a suddenly. In the midst of prayers, the battle becomes, in the midst of praise, the battle becomes God's. In the midst of praise, God speaks supernatural things to strange things and people or fish to spit you on dry land. In the midst of praise comes the chains that are broken off supernaturally. But friends, some of you are about ready to enter into the greatest time of your life and you need to start praising God even if you don't feel like it because it's the sacrifice of praise. In Psalms 149, I'll just pop it up on the overhead and I'm finished for tonight. In Psalms 1, praise the Lord, sing the Lord a new song, his praise and assembly of the saints. All through Psalms 149, it tells you to praise God, praise God, praise God. And if you think that's great, 12 times in Psalms 150, 12 times, praise him, praise him. Praise him in the morning. Praise him when you get up. Praise him in the evening. Praise him when you're laying down. Praise him in this, praise him in that, praise him in that. What is God trying to say? Never stop praising God. As simple as that. Walking down the street, I praise you, Lord, give you praise, glory, and honor. 
Thank you, Lord, you're the supplier of all of my needs. But guess what, Lord, you're healing me by your stripes. I am healed because you're almighty God and you've given me the eternal promise, God. It's your word and I thank you, God. I don't know if it's happening today. That doesn't matter. It's gonna happen when you want it to happen. Thank you, God, you're gonna have me on dry land. You're gonna bring the battle to you and you're going to open up the gates of all of the prisons and the chains are gonna fall off in the name of Jesus. For all of us, we need to praise the Lord all the time. Amen, amen. If you got something from God, tell him. Amen. Hallelujah. Come on, come on, praise him now. Praise him for that problem. Praise him for that problem. Praise him for your healing. Come on, praise him for your finances. Praise him. Praise him, praise him, praise him. In good times and bad, praise him. Don't know how you're gonna make it, praise him. Don't know where it's coming from, praise him. I want to make sure before you leave that everybody's all right with God. It would be terrible for you to come into this place and not be right with God. You aren't a Christian because you call yourself a Christian. Did you know that? And you're not a Christian because you do good things. You don't become a Christian because you go to church. And you're not a Christian because your mom and dad told you you're a Christian. Or you wear a cross around your neck, or you have a St. Christopher, or you, if you will, have a bumper sticker on your car that says Christians are forgiven and they're whatever. You're a Christian because you made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. In order to do that, you have to give him all of your heart, and you have to give him all of your life. Yep, you gotta give it to him because he's not a thief to rob you of your heart in your life. He gave you a free will choice. And just like Jehoshaphat, who chose to seek the Lord, you have to choose to give God all of your heart and choose to give God all of your life. He won't make you do it. He's not going to hit you in the head with a two by four. He's not going to pinch your law arms off until you give him in. You know, he could have made a billion robots that look exactly like you. Every single one of them worship him. He didn't. He gave you a free will choice to call upon the name of the Lord and give God all of your heart and give God all of your life. So here you are tonight, we've laughed, we've clapped, we've sung, we've shouted in this safe and friendly place. Tonight is a great night to give God once and for all, all of your heart and all of your life. Jesus said it like this in the book of Revelation. He says, I'm coming again, and when I come, I better find you hot or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. In other words, even if you call yourself a Christian and you're lukewarm, you're going to get vomited from the mouth of Jesus. Some of you have been lukewarm. Little in, little out, little up, little down. You're not against God. No, 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 no. You're not against God. Watch this. But you're not wholehearted for God. And he knows it and you know it. And it's time to turn that around and give God all of your heart, give God all of your life. Be born again, headed for heaven, and deny in your presence in hell. And so tonight is your night. All across this auditorium, you say, well, Pastor Jim, how do I get right with God? How do I give him all of my heart, give him all of my life? Well, let's do it God's way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. In a moment, I'll count to three. I'll go like this. One, two, three, and I'll go like this. Bite, when you hear that sound. Bang! Your hand goes up, I'll see your hand go up. What you're saying by the raising of your hand, now watch me, listen to me now, listen, listen, listen. What you're saying by the raising of your hand is, I don't want Jesus in my head like most Americans. I wanna give him all of my heart, give him all of my life, be born again, headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. You know why it's important that I see it? Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'm a man, he says, I'll confess you as mine before the Father. But if you deny me, I will deny you, Jesus said. 
Tonight, some of you are sitting there and you haven't really given God all of your heart. You haven't really given God all of your life. And you know it. You're not born again. You think you might be, but you're not. Because until you've given him all of your heart, until you've given him all of your life, you're not saved. And tonight is your night of salvation. It's time to get out of that lukewarm position and get into a fervent position, position with God. Like Jehoshaphat, you're going to seek after God. You're going to have to do your thing. You have to make yourself do this. And all across, some people say, wait a minute, you want me to raise my hand when I hear that one, two, three, the clam clap? I'll be embarrassed if I raise my hand. I'll feel funny. The people I came with will see me. People behind me will see me raise my hand. Yep, you'll feel funny. You might be embarrassed for a moment. Get over it. It's better to be embarrassed for a moment than to be in hell forever and ever because you care more about what people think instead of what God says and what God sees. Tonight is your night of salvation. I'm finished. I'm going to count to three. Who should raise her hand if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your heart, I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your life, I'm speaking to you. If you're one of those people that are in here and you're not sure, hey, why not make sure? What, what could be wrong with that? Make sure that you're right with God if you're not sure. Tonight is your night of salvation. I'm counting to three. Here it is. Get ready to pop your hand up all over this auditorium. Here it is. Ready? One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Across here. One. Thank you. There's two. Thank you. There's three. Thank you. There's four. God bless you. Back over here, anybody else, real quick. There's another one, five, thank you. There's six, there's seven, hallelujah. Thank you, my friend. There's seven of you, great. There's eight, God bless you. Anybody else, real quick. There's eight wise people. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else, real quick. There's eight wise people. Anybody else? All right, well, let's give the Lord a great big praise for eight wise people. Here's what I want you to do. All eight of you, I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible friend, get your stuff. All eight of you, raise your hand. You're serious about God. You don't get saved by raising your hand. You get saved by giving them all of your heart and all of your life. I'm going to help you to do that. So I want you, if you raise your hand, you're serious about God. Listen, 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 listen. If you should have raised your hand, but you didn't, but you know you should have, you can come too. Come too. Get your stuff. Get in the aisle. Meet me right here in front. All eight of you. Nobody leave during this period of time. I'll let you go in a moment. And you come right now. All eight of you. Get out of your seat. Bring a friend if you need to. Come on. Get up here right now. Come on. Jesus, I believe. Come on. 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 Jesus, I belong to you. You're the reason that I live. Oh yeah, come on, they're coming. Give them a hand as they come. Give them a hand as they come. Come on home. Come on home. Come on. This is a great time. Jesus, I belong Make room for them. They're coming. You're the reason that I live. You're the reason that I breathe. Hey, well, thank God you guys have come. Really cool. Put a smile on your face. This is a good thing, not a bad thing. You're not going to more. You're going to heaven. <laughs> and so that ought to make you happy. I want to point out something to you. Look at me real quick. This guy over here waving at you, his name is Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel is a really good guy. No weird, strange, or crazy stuff goes on. He's going to do three things. Pray with you, give you some free information about what to do next, and then invite you back to church. We'll help you to do it, introduce you to a program we have called Spiritual Personal Trainers, an individual who will meet you with you before church, buy you coffee, tea, nachos, whatever you want, and go over the Bible with you and help you to get strong. You need somebody to pray for you. And that's what a spiritual personal trainer will do. He'll tell you more about that. Make a left turn, follow him right over there. Let's give the Lord a great big praise. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent Him for me and that He died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that His blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature 
in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.